Welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing to the channel or visiting my website to become a member for more exclusive content. Now, at the outset, you said there are two things about cancer that make it different from self. It has these two properties that individually wouldn't be the end of the world, but when you combine them, they're devastating. It's this failure to respond to cell cycle signaling, which results in unregulated growth. And it's this capacity to leave the site of origin and go and grow in an unregulated manner elsewhere. And you also mentioned that this is the result of, although you didn't use the word, somatic mutations. And we'll, we, which you, we can clarify for people, these aren't typically mutations that people are born with, although in diseases like Lynch syndrome, that might be the case, that it leads to that. But, but for, these are acquired mutations. So the natural question would be, why is it that a cell that has these acquired mutations that clearly produce a phenotype that is different from self, why wouldn't that be foreign enough for the immune system to act? In other words, why does cancer even exist in the first place? Why doesn't it get squashed out in its infancy? So these mutations, these changes in DNA that are random events as the cell is, as the cell is dividing, can produce proteins that can be recognized or other molecules recognized by the immune system. And they do it in complex ways by breaking down small molecule peptides and putting it on the cell surface. But the immune system can recognize these mutations. And it's only been in the last, I'd say, three or four years that we now recognize these mutations uh, as commonly recognized by the immune system. And about 80% of patients with the common epithelial cancers, it turns out as a result of the research done in recent years, do exist that can recognize the products of the mutations. But the immune system against them is too small, is not vigorous enough. What does that mean? Create enough cells, create receptors that have a high enough avidity for recognition to the uh, to the tumor. The immune reaction is not very strong and the growth of the tumor can overcome the small impact that an immune reaction might have in killing some, uh, some tumor cells. Plus for a tumor cell to survive and grow, it develops certain properties that can suppress the local immune reaction. It can make molecules like transforming growth factor beta, TGF beta. It can make cytokines like interleukin-10. It can cause the development of cells, lymphocytes, that inhibit immune reactions. I mean, virtually every physiologic system in, in the body has stimulatory elements and inhibitory elements. You have hormones that can increase gastric secretion, some that can decrease it. You have a sympathetic nervous system, a parasympathetic nervous system. Well, the immune system is the same. It has effector cells that can be very aggressive in recognizing antigens, and it has regulatory T cells that deliberately suppress immune reactions. And that's one of the things that keeps us from developing autoimmune, uh, autoimmune disease. But there are many of these regulatory elements. Recently described myeloid-derived suppressor cells can suppress immune reactions. And so it's the balance of the aggressive immune reaction against the inhibitory molecules that can prevent that immune reaction that is the holy grail of trying to find effective, uh, effective treatments. And effective treatments come in both directions. Interleukin-2 stimulates immune reactions, and we now have checkpoint modulators like ipilimumab or uh, uh, PD-1 inhibitors that uh, can unleash can inhibit these inhibitory factors and thereby stimulate the immune reaction by taking away the breaks on the immune system. So the more we understand, the more we can take advantage of the biology.